Okay. Sure. All right. Um, first, just I'm really happy to be here, and, and thanks a lot for having me. I think that there's a lot of issues that conservatives and progressives don't necessarily agree on, but I think going after a lot of these special interest tax breaks happens to be one of them. So I'm, I'm glad that to be here today. Um, and well, first, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what, what ITEP is and what we do. Um, we're a nonpartisan research and advocacy organization. We work at the state and federal level. And probably, I think, what we're most known for and what we kind of have the new capacity to do is do distributional and, and scores of, of tax plans, both at the national level, which several groups can do, but also at the state level. So if you've seen distributional numbers, for example, most recently in Kentucky or Oklahoma, a lot of those are coming from our micro simulation. Um, so turning, uh, so I think uh, Stephen took us really into the, the weeds of things, and I'm going to kind of take a step back and take us back into the more the big picture thing. And so I think, you know, we've already gone over what a lot of these tax incentives are, so I kind of wanted to start with, well, why do they exist in the first place? Why do lawmakers politically choose to create a bunch of temporary tax provisions in the code? I think there's really two clear reasons for this. One, I think it's to hide the fiscal costs, is that they want to pass a lot of these different tax breaks, but doing so a year at a time helps them somehow convince people that this is not fiscally irresponsible. And so just taking the ones that we're talking about today, is in 2018, they cost just about $4.2 billion. And so $4.2 billion is enough that you could probably make an excuse to put it in the deficit or even come up with some kind of gimmick, say, sell money from the strategic petroleum reserve and, and pay for it. But, but as has already been noted, over 10 years, it's $92 billion, and that starts adding up. And, and, and over the years, there's been a lot more tax extenders. And as this package gets passed year after year, more and more provisions get, get put on there. And so that $92 billion could end up being hundreds of billions of dollars if it continues as it's going. And I think a perfect example of how this kind of really changes the baseline is the research credit was originally passed in 1981, and then it kept getting sort of renewed year after year after year. And only a couple of years ago, after decades of continual renewal and decades of it not really being considered part of the baseline, was it finally put, in, put into effect. So I think that just shows we really need to do these things. And then I think the other big thing is that it creates this really problematic and what I call a symbiotic relationship between special interest lobbyists and lawmakers. And, and my old boss, Bob McIntyre, used to call this the Tax Lobbyist Full Employment Act. And the reason is, is because if this is passed year after year, it means that tax lobbyists and the supporters of these have to go back year after year. And, and for, on some level, in terms of their employment, it's actually better for them if they have to keep doing this on and on. And even for lawmakers, it's better not to make them permanent because it means that each year they get to say, we, you know, we fought really hard for this industry. We re fought really hard for this person. And, and you know, we, we passed it. And it's a shame we couldn't make it permanent. But, you know, at least we got it for another year. And I think a, kind of a perfect example of how these special interest pieces can actually have, are really kind of a bipartisan problem, is two of the provisions in this set that we're talking about. One is the, the tax break for racehorses, I think is highly associated with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who happens to be from Kentucky, which has a lot of racehorses. And also, on the other side, uh, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer is highly associated with the, the tax break for live theater productions. He's got Broadway and a lot of other things. So I think this is really a bipartisan problem where people are promoting their local interests. Do this right. There we go. And so it's just kind of, again, taking a step back is, is here's the framework that we really think about when looking at these, these tax expenditures and also just tax expenditures in general. I think the first question you have to ask is, does this tax provision serve a compelling public interest? And it's striking looking at these provisions that many of them don't even pass a basic smell test. Is a tax break for racehorses really a broad public interest? I think it's pretty easy to straightforwardly say no. And then if you do think that it serves a compelling public interest, is it doing so in a cost-effective way? And the one that I always use as an example here is in empowerment zones, I think, um, have a really good idea behind them. The idea is to help areas that need help developing and, and in turn of driving investment to them. But study after study has shown that this is not a particularly effective way to do so. And it actually often um, is just a windfall to those investors not really promoting much. And so if it, if it passes these two tests, I think another test you really need is how should this provision be paid for? I think given our, our $12 trillion deficit looking forward, and CBO just had new numbers on this that are really not looking good, that, that you really can't continuously pass these tax cuts um, and, and, and ignore their costs. So if it's good enough to be in the tax code, it's good enough to be paid for and not just kind of ignored year after year. All right, so I think that the, the kind of bigger picture solution that we, that we need to look at is how do we bring permanency to the tax code. And I, and I think there's kind of three areas that I've been thinking a lot about when it, when it comes to this. Is first, 
is the 28 uh, tax extenders that we've been talking about. And, and I think that, you know, like has already been discussed, the first big step would be to, to have a cost-benefit analysis of each of these, whether it's performed by the General County Office or the, uh, the Congressional Research Service or others. I think we need to go through each one of these and really dig into them. And I think a lot of them, it will become really obvious that they should be allowed to expire, others that, that should be kept, and that we should just finally perform this analysis. And, and if they are good ones, then we should pay for them. I think the second thing that I, I wanted to note was just that there are other additional leftover extenders. There, there's, as part of the PATH Act a few years ago, some of them were extended five years. So there was these sort of set that we're talking about now, but then there's others that were there. So I think we need to apply the same evaluation to many of those. The, the two in particular that, that I don't particularly like that, that I think should remain expired are the CFC look-through rule and also the new markets tax credit, both of which I think um, really don't provide much benefit. In the case of the CFC look-through rule, I actually think that it promotes international tax avoidance, which is something that, that we don't, uh, shouldn't really support. And then another thing I wanted to kind of throw in in this section is, is that I think it's you got to talk about not only the provisions that are expiring, but in many cases, the provisions that haven't al been allowed to go into effect. I think I was reading the CBO report again, and I was really struck by the fact that the health care taxes haven't been, that haven't been allowed to go into effect are actually a pretty big chunk of change, it's hundreds of billions of dollars. And I, I'm personally not the biggest fan of, of the structures of those taxes, but I think that you either need to let them go into effect and have people pay them, or you need to p pay for pay for getting rid of them. And I think that this continuous process of kicking them a year, kicking them a couple years, um, should no longer be allowed to go into effect. And then I think the last thing that we need to talk about, which is kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to permanency in the tax code, is the temporary provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And I think that, um, you know, one, one, one really big disappointment in, in looking at the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is that, that lawmakers for years, and when they passed the PATH Act, a few years ago, they said, well, this is the last time we're ever going to deal with extenders. This is the last time, you know, there'll be no more extenders. And they didn't really meet what I kind of saw as a minimum standard of tax reform. Like, I had a lot of other issues with the bill. But to me, one of the minimum standards should have been dealing with all these individual provisions. And, and I was struck that they didn't do that. And then also, they created a lot more temporary provisions, which, which I think is, is a real problem and creates a lot of uncertainty in the code. And I also think just from a bigger picture perspective on permanency, I also don't think that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is um, particularly sustainable. And I think that, 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 so the solution for many is, we'll make all the provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act permanent. And I think that that really misses the picture, that it's not sustainable because we have such a large debt coming out. And, may, and, and putting all of these provisions into effect permanently would cost hundreds of billions of dollars more. I mean, the CBO says we're facing this $12 trillion deficit, and I don't think we can pile hundreds of billions of dollars of additional tax cuts on top of that. So I think that in order to create a real permanent tax code, we'll need to uh, roll back some of the provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and also go after a lot of other tax expenditures. I think there's actually even a way to do this in a way that doesn't involve raising rates really high in, in ways that, that I know the Tax Foundation and others would like. I think we could go after a lot of these tax expenditures, raise the revenue we need, and, and create a much more sustainable tax code. And so I think just to, to kind of reiterate, the three kind of key takeaways I want to say here is, first, I think it is a critical first step to, to end the tax extenders tradition. I think it's been really poisonous to the tax policymaking process, and it needs to end. I think, two, that real permanence in the tax code will require raising substantially more revenue and rolling back portions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And finally, any tax expenditure, whether it's one of these tax extenders or, or not, should be um, subject to a careful cost-benefit analysis. And that's all I got. And so feel free to ask any questions or to check out more of our work. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Very good. Patrick Mackler and I work for Senator Ron Johnson. Um, Richard, I'm going to ask you in particular. Um, generally speaking, one imagines that progressives dislike the idea of companies lobbying for a tax break. It's a, it, it presents a threat of business owning government in a sense, given the importance of expensing, or excuse me, of uh, depreciation, cost, uh, cost recovery uh, mechanisms as a means of providing tax breaks, what is it that keeps progressivism in general, the left, from simply saying, screw it, we're going to go with, we will back ex full expensing because it knocks the legs out, out, out of a lot of tax breaks that we don't like? I mean, I think, I think that there's kind of two pieces of the answer here. One, I think it's just how we conceptualize an income tax and, and how you measure income. And we see that, that 
the way to measure income is to depreciate it by its economic value, and that's sort of the way you calculate income, and thus they should pay taxes on that. And full expensing would sort of put that completely out of whack. And I think there's also, especially right now, a second piece of which, which is expensing is very expensive. And, and although I've read many pieces by the Tax Foundation and I appreciate their work, we just don't think that this, this investment boost that, that is being advocated is, is really going to come to fruition. And we think that that's a little bit evidenced by the fact that, that the bonus depreciation we have right now hasn't created this massive surge of economic growth and, and that a lot of businesses right now through Section 179 actually have full expensing right now. And again, we haven't seen a huge boost from that. But I know that Steve's going to disagree with me about that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, David Wentworth, Taxpayers for Common Sense. Um, to some extent, all three of you, but again, particularly Richard, um, talked about the political, not imperatives, but the political incentives to have uh, tax expenditures. Um, and I think all three of you said it would be a good thing to get, uh, sorry, extenders, to get rid of extenders. Um, but how do you actually get from here to there politically? It's all fine and dandy to say, there are political incentives to do this. We ought to have a systematic approach that gets rid of them. But I don't see how you run the politics to actually change the system. Neither do I. I, I, mean, I mean, I guess my very practical step would be that, that the members of Congress get a uh, Congressional Research Service or the GAO to report, do a report on each of them. And they have more. I mean, they had one mega hearing, which uh, some of us were at uh, about them. But I think Really, just having a hearing where you go through each one and examine them piece by piece um, would be the, the starting point. And then at the end of the year, take the results of that and, and create a bill. 